right, so the next guests that we have coming up are Mr. R.H. Davis and Hazen Mitchell. They're going to be talking to us about some lessons learned with ATVs. So uh, let's all give them our undivided attention because we all could use a little education on this or a little reminder. Good morning. So I'm R.H. Davis. I'm a land manager with the St. John's River Water Management District. And um, I'll talk to you this morning about some things that have occurred with us over the years with dealing with ATVs and their use on prescribed fire and kind of how that altered and kind of changed the direction and our outlook in the program. Um, starting out, we kind of look at kind of roughly some kind of safety metrics just to kind of give you an idea of kind of where we are or where we are as a program. We've been, had a really good safety record. I mean, we started, we implemented our first prescribed fire in 1993. Um, since that time, we've done over 1,700 prescribed burns. And throughout that, we've had eight safety related incidents through the whole 29 years of the program. Five of those had to deal with um, equipment. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two of those today. Um, one of which kind of changed the policy for our fire program. So that first incident, this was the one that changed, uh, kind of changed our policy occurred on, on uh, March 19th, um, 2010. And it was a uh, 281 acre prescribed burn that was in some old farm fields. Um, and we had, it was kind of one of those deals where you kind of had a kind of busy paved road to the north and then there was a private airport uh, adjacent to it on the west. So we were trying to get it done as quick as we could uh, to minimize any impacts to that airport is that, you know, it didn't have a lot of traffic coming out of it, but there was you know, 15, 20 planes taking off and landing out of there every day. Um, so the idea was with that was that we were gonna strip head that block and we were gonna use three ATVs with igniters on it. And back in that day, it was, you know, a man running on a four wheeler with holding a torch off to the side. Um, and that block had, it was old farm fields. So it had field ditching that was oriented north to south through it. And those field ditches were, six to eight feet top of bank, top of bank, and about two and a half feet deep uh, on average. And as we were going through that burn that day, we got about halfway through and one of the igniters impacted a spot in one of those field ditches. You can kind of see it there where the bike's sitting in the picture that was a little bit too steep for the bike to crawl out of. Um, didn't stick the bike, but whenever he hit it, the front bumper hit the offside of the ditch and it stopped the bike. It throwed the operator forward up against the handlebars and subsequently caused the torch to swing around the left side of the bike. So he, he basically rang the bike in with fire when he did it. Um, the primary fuels in that block that day was frostbit, mainly just frostbit pasture grasses. So it was, they were pretty cured. They were pretty receptive. Uh, by the time he dismounted, the fire was already on the bike um, and, and the tires and, and the plastics on the bike was beginning to, to already ignite. Um, the operator didn't get injured in that. So, but kind of what we learned from that deal was, and this was, I didn't mention earlier, I have the, I have the honor of being the, uh, the manager that's had both of these incidents with these ATVs happen in, in my work unit. So, um, but this was one of my burns and it was one of those deals where, you know, we were pretty familiar with that unit. We were pretty familiar with the layout of those ditches and we had been out there on four wheelers doing different things many times and it had no issues crossing those ditches. It just so happened that that particular strip had that day hit that one spot in the ditch where it was gonna cause you to hang up a little bit. And my ignition plan for that was pretty much centered on strip heads because I was thinking I need to get this burn done as quick as I can. So I said, we wanna just get in there and strip the thing out. Um, but I didn't account for those irregularities that were there and the potential that we could have an issue. Um, and that kind of put my crew at a higher risk. 
And, you know, in hindsight, looking back at it after we've kind of had time, we had time to reflect on it. We could have, we could have approached that differently. We could have flanked that fire um, with multiple flanks interior and we could have pulled fire up through that thing parallel with those ditches and we'd have never had to worry about crossing them the whole day. Could have still accomplished our burn uh, and met the objectives that we needed to meet with the burn and got it done efficiently and quickly. It, and honestly, you know, uh, when you get that call on a, uh, that, you know, you've had something like that and that you've got a piece of equipment that's been burned over, uh, it kind of gets your attention. Um, and this, you know, this was the one that changed our policy. And it changed my outlook on how I wanted, how I would go, go forward with planting burns in the future. The second incident occurred this year in February. Uh, this one was a little different. And this bike had been used all day, had been getting run on roads around roads and levees around the, the perimeter of the burn uh, and on mineral soil fire lines. Um, for the entirety of the burn. A couple key things with this is that the operator filled that bike up with a fuel can just before we had briefing that morning. And after talking with him about it, he, he filled that thing with every drop of fuel that you could put in it. I mean, he, he put gas all the way to the top of the filler neck on it. And, um, but you would think as we went through the, the course of the day, you know, the, the, the incident with the ATV happened about four hours into the burn. Uh, we were getting pretty close to wrapping up for the day. The operator had finished firing a section out, a little pocket in the corner of the burn. He had walked up in there and fired it out and he'd walked back out and was just kind of sitting on the bike. Um, he had the motor off, but he had the key cycled on. I don't know, you know, our guys over the years when we first started getting into these water cooled bikes, um, they'd start running a little warm with you. The cooling systems wouldn't really keep up on them. They'd start running a little warm with you. So you'd turn the, you'd leave the key on, you'd cycle the key on, let the fan run a cooling cycle, kind of help cool it down. Well, he was doing that with this particular bike, was sitting there with the motor off and the key was on. And something caught his eye. He looked down and between the between the rear fender well on the right side and the and the rear wheel, he noticed the spray of fuel coming out from the side of the bike. Uh, that spray of fuel shot out about six to eight feet away from the bike and hit a burning log on the edge of the fire line. And then the fire traveled back up the spray of fuel and hit the bike. And then um, he switched key off, jumped off the bike, tried to use the water tank on the bike to kind of knock it down. That was kind of worked for a minute, but then he realized that that, that fuel spray wasn't going to stop. So at that point, he just cut the straps and pulled the equipment off the bike and walked away from it. Um, basically, this was just kind of one of them freak things. I mean, we were operating, and I'll, as we go into summary here in a little bit, I'll kind of go through um, how our policy changed over the years. But we were operating within the rules of what we needed to, and, and, and sometimes you can try to do everything right. Sometimes you're still going to get a bad result. And... Um, and that was kind of what happened here. Um, so in this one, you know, you kind of, the one thing that, that kind of come back to me and it, I don't know, it just seems like any more fuel. I don't know if y'all witnessed it or not, but to me, it seems like fuel reacts different these days than what it used to. Um, there's a lot of stuff. If you start, you know, I do our RT-130 classes. I kind of piece those together and, and doing the research this year. There's a lot of information out there about fuel geysering, things like that. Um, in essence, that's kind of what we had happen here. Um, you would think after three to four hours of operation of that bike, we probably developed enough airspace in that fuel tank to handle expansion, but we can't really say. For whatever reason, Maybe when the fuel, the key was cycled on, it's got an electric fuel pump. Maybe that thing didn't cut out whenever it reached pressure or whatever. Uh, the vent system maybe wasn't working correctly, but for whatever reason, it overpressurized. The way that vent system was designed on that particular bike, there was some type of a split or a pinhole in the vent tube that allowed the fuel to come out the side of the bike. 
if the vent tube would have been together the way it should have been, fuel would have been going straight down under the bike between the rear wheels. Um, so I guess the take home from this is uh, just kind of, you know, respect that fill level, um, which when you crowd that and you don't leave proper airspace in there, you're asking for a potential uh, to get over pressurization in there with heat and things going on throughout the day. Inspect your equipment. Uh, we do regular inspections. All of that equipment gets some, you know, at least one PM a year, if not multiple PMs a year. Um, but regularly inspect your equipment. You know, if we'd have picked up that split and that vent line, you know, that fuel would have been shooting straight down on the ground instead of out on the side of the bike. And final thing with that is expect the unexpected. If there's one thing I've come to learn uh, in almost 30 years of being in this kind of work and working in the woods, uh, the unexpected is gonna happen when you least expect it. Um, so in summary here to, to kind of wrap things up, that 2010 incident. So prior to that 2010 incident, we were, uh, we used ATVs almost exclusively to do a lot of our interior ignition. Um, and I can honestly say, you know, reflecting back on it now, we put those machines in places that we probably had no business putting them. And you get this kind of a um, sense of confidence, I guess you would say, because you got that, you know, you got that thing with the motor on it. You know, if something goes bad, I can get out of there pretty quick, whatever. Um, but you don't think a lot about that, you know, that deep spot in that ditch, that gopher hole that might cave in, that stump that you can't see um, that cluster of palmetto roots just a little bit too high that high centers it. Um, so after that 2010 incident, that day, our policy was changed that we would no longer use those bikes interior. Um, so we, our ATV and UTV use was limited to being on established perimeter and interior maintained fire lines and roads only. So we had to know before we allowed them to be in there, especially if it was something up in the interior, that that fire line or that road or that hiking trail, we had to check it, make sure that it was clear, it was traversable. There wasn't something in there, you know, a bad hole in there that you'd get stuck on. Uh, interior ignition, we, you know, any interior ignition was done, was done on foot or as a lot of y'all know, uh, in the inception of our program in 1993, we used horses. Um, we used horses to do a lot of our interior ignition up until 2020 when that program was also retired. And I can say that we never had an incident with a horse. Um, we never burned a horse. The horse always knew when to go, where to go and where not to go. And if you tried to push him somewhere he didn't need to be, he wouldn't go there. Um, so he kept, they kept us safe. Um, but we began to focus a lot on doing alternative, you know, techniques. Um, in my work unit, you know, a lot of our different regional managers and, and burn managers, you know, kind of had their own way of doing things. But in my work unit, we began to focus a lot more on flanking fires and use, utilizing flanking fires off the perimeter and any interior roads, trails, breaks that we had in there that we could get the fire oriented right. If it was fairly rough fuels, if we needed to try to get a plank squared around to get it to do what we needed it to do, we'd use flares until they got to be $10 a shot. Um, and then we kind of started backing out of that. And then here recently with, you know, with the power shots and stuff like that, uh, that's been a really good tool to be able to minimize that risk of putting people <laughs> interior. I personally prefer not to put somebody inside a block and I won't do it unless I just have to, to get the burn done and get the burn objectives met. But even at that, we look real hard at, is that something that we need to be going into? Am, am I relatively sure that that person can get in there and they're not gonna run up in, you know, that big patch of gator bikes with a bunch of smile acts in it and get kind of hung up in the middle. Um, when you get close to having an incident where you, where you you're, you're right on that cusp of getting somebody burned. It kind of changes your, your outlook on how you approach things. Um, and then wrapping up for my part of this here, can you use an ATV effectively, safely to, to do interior ignition? Absolutely. Um, but 
us for an agency, we determined that that risk was not worth the reward. There was other ways to do it. And that kind of put us in that position to figure that out. And I think we've become pretty effective, you know, using these other methods. And honestly, at this point, I don't miss them as far as using them interior. Um, but I think you need to give consideration when you're looking at it, pay attention to the fuel tops, know your block, kind of know what your hazards are and be sure that you're, you're, you're paying attention to ensure that your crews are gonna be able to be safe when they're in there doing it and just weigh the risk against the reward. If you don't think it's really worth it, don't, you know, don't put them in there. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Hazen and, and he's gonna to talk to you about his program where they've kind of had some similar experiences as we did, but they've kind of went a different route. Okay, so my name is Hazen Mitchell. I work for the Florida Department of Military Affairs on Camp Blanding Joint Training Center. Uh, we do extensive ATV operations, and so I'm here to talk about uh, the bullets we've dodged. We haven't dodged them all. We have also lost two ATVs through interior ignition. The first one was in 2006, a cooperator's antique bike. The best we can tell is the engine just kind of straight fell apart and dumped every fluid it had directly under the bike. Uh, the operator kind of didn't have a lot of options there. We talked to him later. He said that he was able to kind of kick out the burning grass but he could not kick out the pile of burning petrochemicals. And so our recommendation following that was, okay, fire extinguisher on every bike. So we rolled along until 2009 where we lost a second bike. That bike was lost due to a series of decisions made uh, by the uh, operator. Um, and that one ended up in relatively heavy fuels, uh, stuck on a plow line, the third plow line. We'd already dodged several evidently. And it was also a total loss. That bike, uh, the operator indicated that he could have saved the bike first if he had suppression water, and second, if he had a winch. So after that, every bike has suppression water and a winch on it. Yeah. So Camp Blanding itself, over there, in, uh, we're in National Guard installation, about 74,000 acres on the west quarter of Clay County. Uh, our first burn plan was written in 1994, so that's where we kind of give the birth of our formal program. Before that, it might have been arson. So in 1998, so just a few years later, we got two ATVs. For perspective, it wasn't until 2000 we got our first Type 6 engine, so that tells you how foundational those ATVs are to our program. They've kind of always been there. Camp Landing experiences about 150 fire events a year. Two thirds of those are typically wildfires and the remaining 40 to 50 are prescribed burns. And a lot of that is on the back of our ATVs. So this is a typical Camp Blanding ATV bike. Uh, this bike is assigned to the fire program. She doesn't do anything else. So um, we typically aim for about a 450 CC bike, maybe 500, but no bigger. What we've learned is that bigger does not equal better. The larger bikes have no additional carrying capacity on the front or rear racks on any of them that I've ever seen on state contract. They're all the same. So you don't get extra oomph carrying that bike. What you do get is extra top speed and extra acceleration, which uh, when you see one of these things with a 10 gallon water tank top itself onto its rear, that's too much. And every severe injury that I've seen anecdotally in this business from ATV is somebody driving it quickly on a road. Our program has no need for a bike that can go 75 miles an hour. That is unnecessary. Our top speed inside a block is usually three to five. So um, we try to get what the industry considers a manual transmission bike. We feel that the ability to get in first and keep it in first is a lot more useful than the ability to not have to hook your toe underneath that annoying thing and uh, wear your feet out all day. You want to be able to stick it low and get out of the mud, get over something, because unlike, uh, well, I mean, I respect RH's program immensely. It's a fantastic program, but we do use these bikes inside. Our losses change our tactics, but not our strategy. Our overall policy of using bikes hasn't changed, but we sure change how we apply them to these fire business. So every bike, you can't see it, of course, has a skid plate underneath it. Those are commercially available sometimes. It's really nice if you have a fabricator on staff that can put one together out of aluminum. 
the skid plate underneath protects a lot of the you know important stuff and can help keep you from getting high centered on something maybe keep a harpoon from going up between the wheels and the other important stuff maybe we feel like there's no reason not to get one you have to buy them sometimes they're pricey but hey maybe you can keep the bike alive another day every bike does carry a fire extinguisher we already talked about um, we also have a winch sitting there in ready position on every bike and then it's got the water tank the water tank is this big cube on the back of the bike it carries 10 gallons that's about 80 some odd pounds that's well within the bustle rating of every ATV that we have that, uh, that system is electric system, so you do need a functional battery, and that's not always the case, but we use an electric system. It has kind of a daisy cord inside it, so you can spray it. It's not truly a fantastic suppression tool. What it is for is to cool the land around the bike that you just set on fire when you get your bike stuck. Though, like everything else, you expand it with use, and we use them for pre-suppression. We use it for mop-up. It's great to go inside to put out a burning cat face on an ancient relic tree that you'd rather not have fall to the ground. Um, and then on the front of the bike, um, oh, also, I'm sorry, we have a little storage compartment in the back. We found that those nylon saddlebags that everybody puts on a bike is a great place to catch fuel. And we burned several. In fact, if there is something on a bike that you can set on fire, we have set it on fire. It's happened more than once. Um, we have more than a few where the plastic shroud is not in good shape. Um, this stuff is pretty rough on your equipment. Um, however, we keep using them. So on the front is our fire tank. So it holds five gallons of mix. Um, they're custom made that we, uh, I don't know, somebody in Gainesville puts them together for us for about, I don't know, it's been a while. It was $700 at the time. So probably it's a million dollars now. But uh, on this piece of equipment, it's got an auxiliary fire pot, which is real handy when you do need to park the bike and go light something else. Also, there's the fire extinguisher is in this thin cylinder over on the, call it the driver's side. You can see a weld right there. What we found is that holding the fire extinguisher where the top is exposed, that turned out poorly. A sand pine or anything else aggressive can rip the top off of a vertically stored uh, fire extinguisher. And when that comes off, the first thing you feel like is that you've landed at the pearly gates. It is quite an explosion as the whole thing vents all at once as a two and a half or five pound fire extinguisher just lets go. So we added some shields to keep those things protected. Uh, unlike the commercially available fire, uh, fire tanks, ours is operated through this wand. It's one handed operation with kind of a modified herbicide uh, trigger with a Panama torch on it. And we find that that works quite well for our operation. Um, it's on off as you as you go, and you have a lot of uh, flexibility when using that. We kind of like it. Um, but every safety protocol everywhere says two hands on the steering yoke all the time. Not with that. So do your risk assessment. Is it going to work out for you? Yeah, so far, it's worked for us, largely. Um, but you will damage equipment. This is rough on the equipment. It's very rough. So you can see why Winky is called that. We harpooned out one of her uh, headlights on a, on a clear cut. You know, log came up and punched right through it. Could that have hit the operator? Yeah, yeah, it could. This is a dangerous business. This using these is a pretty good way of picking up an injury. You have to be very careful in that. It's also very rough on your equipment and that becomes expensive. We are willing to do the paperwork on maintenance for this. What we are not willing, well, I mean, I guess we have to, but we're not interested in doing the paperwork on an injury. That's our hard line. Don't do something unsafe. Um, and then we try to roll our ATVs out of fire or actually out of use at all after a decade. What we found is that you can't find spare parts after 10 years. Uh, the, the, the manufacturers don't tend to keep them around. And boy, this uses a lot of spare parts to keep these things running on a fire. So you might ask, why do we do it? So RH has already explained the issues they have and the, the very real chance of injury that they've experienced in their program, we have as well. Well, that's why. So there's our FAS and he is spraying with the one-handed operation. Uh, the pump inside is a little fuel pump from uh, I think a race car, I don't know, some sort of automotive fuel pump. And it works quite well. He's reaching out about 20 feet before it even starts falling down. That lets us reach over a ditch. That lets us get the fire kind of away from the operator. It doesn't seem like it, but it does. Uh, and you'd sometimes need a lot of fuel, which if you are paying for your fuel instead of the state and federal taxpayer, 
it gets pricey. These things really do drink a lot of fuel. But if you've ever also tried to kick the fire through a stupid clear cut or a live oak litter, you need a lot of fuel. This, job, this guy does the job. And that one-handed wand is very agile. You can put it exactly where it is so you don't waste that very expensive fuel because, of course, you're a good steward to the taxpayer's money. So um, we find that an ATV is a heck of a program accelerator. That lets us do things that we couldn't normally do. So um, on a hot day in June, you know, you're looking at approaching 100 degrees. I don't know what your burn crew looks like, but ours says that's just not great. And how much can you burn in fuels where you are walking at, you know, 100 degrees? And it's Florida, so of course it's wet. How far can you go? Well, for, you know, 80 acres, that's a great burn. On an ATV, we can do 10 times as many acres quite easily. So we can burn 800 acres on a day that normally we could only get 50 to 80. That matters. Um, we, have a, we have a block on the installation that has a one mile road on all four sides. It's a square mile. It is a pretty nice sand hill. We can burn that whole sand hill in 90 minutes. Two bikes, 90 minutes, five people total, done. That matters. Now, don't race just to race, um, but sometimes you do wanna get it done before that smoke drops down on a road, get it up and out of there. We just, a couple of weeks ago with our cooperators from Florida Fish and Wildlife used six bikes to burn 2,100 acres. Program accelerator. We have federal and state minimum burn requirements due to some agreements that we've signed that everybody's all about, but we gotta get that stuff done. And if we can do it safely, we're all about it. And I feel that this is a way to do that. So we have learned a lot from this stuff over the years. I've been doing this. I've been part of the burn program for several decades now and use these ATVs extensively. And every time there's an issue, we always talk about it. We listen to our friends and neighbor when they have issues. What happened? Why was that injury? Why, what happened there? So that we can grow our program. And uh, if something indicated we have to park these bikes, we would, but so far we're, we're dodging enough bullets to keep going on that. Um, so that's the first one. Following our 2009 uh, issue, we learned, none of us knew this, uh, that uh, there is formal professional ATV training. The ATV Training Institute or Safety Institute is a industry group that puts together training because every time someone gets hurt on one of these bikes, people stop buying them. So they have this training. We sent two of our people up to Alpharetta up there in Georgia to become trainers for that. And then everybody on staff, you do not use a bike without that training. Formal, you get a little card, they'll put it on your red card if you have that, that's pretty nice too. It's not enough. So there are a lot of people in North Central Florida that have spent their life recreating on these bikes. Well, going 25 mile an hour through a mud bog all day is great, but that is not the skill that you need to do this job. So what we found is that people need to have a fire mind on all this. So, um, it really is, as much as it is kind of tough to talk to someone that's been doing ATV for 30 years and say, you, you don't have the experience to do this job, that's very real. So we include um, kind of, our program is small enough that we can kind of know everybody. And so we start off crawling, you know, ATV on the road, scouting, uh, maybe bringing supplies, but no interior ignition, maybe light a road, maybe catch a road up. Uh, and of course, scouting, scouting, scouting. An ATV, you have great visibility, People can't see you, particularly when you've punched one of your headlights out, but you have great visibility and then you can uh, help those larger, bulkier type sixes, type fours, whatever you've got. Um, but once a person has developed some fire experience, understanding fuel types, understanding that the ATV operator has full authority to override the ignition plan on a burn. On Camp Blanding, they can absolutely do that because they're the ones looking at what's about to flip their bike or get their bike stuck. The burn boss is maybe not anywhere nearby or the firing boss, so they have the authority to do that. However, they need to understand enough to say, this is the right decision for what I can do. We'll change this ignition pattern. However, we will still achieve objectives. You come across a massive palmetto clump. What do you do? Light it, don't light it, try to go straight through it. No, don't do that. Um, you have to understand enough about fire behavior and fuel types so that you make the right call when you say, okay, I need to, I need to stop doing a strip and I need to switch over to some dots. And you have the authority to do that as an ATV operator, but that comes with time. Um, and the biggest one, almost everything is size up. You need to be able to do a size up, a constant size up, size up again and again and again, whatever, whatever term you use for keep your head on a swivel, maintain situational awareness. Using a bike inside a block 
you're only going maybe three miles an hour, but that is very fast. You need to have so many things going in your mind all at once. You need to be looking, well, first, am I achieving my objective? Is my torch, is it blown out? Uh, am I about to drive through trees that I cannot get through? Is the fuel too rough? Am I about to encounter some of RH's cruel and unusual geography? You need to constantly, constantly, constantly be re-upping that. And that's not something that comes on the first day. That comes from being part of a fire program and doing this stuff on foot for a while when you do have a little bit more time. And of course, you're always looking for that escape route. You know, what the fire in the wrong place, you don't want to have to jump off a bike and go, but if you have to, you have to, but it's way better if you can get the bike out too. Um, and so that's a pretty darn big deal. Um, and then communication on a bike is hard. Bikes are loud. Radios are always terrible. And so communication is the grim reaper for our business when there's communication issue. It happens on every issue. Every time there's a problem, communication issues in there. You lose situational awareness of your radio inside these bikes. Um, so some of us have earpieces or speaker mics to try to ameliorate that, but it's very difficult to track what's going on and, while operating on this bike. And so anytime there's any sort of communication, I don't know, restriction, that's a watch out. And uh, every time we do any sort of interior ignition, we will always kind of have a little face-to-face -face brief with anybody doing that on the bike, regardless of the overall program. We always kind of have a little talky talk about it. One of those is the rescue and recovery procedure because you have to have that. Now, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing here. However, we have ways of communicating in my program that indicate, hey, I'm, I'm kind of stuck. I need you to come help, help me winch out. And this is urgent. This bike is going to burn if you don't get here right now and somebody's hurt. Now that has not happened, but we always have that in the back of our mind. You could have a mayday. So there is everybody we work with, has, we have a way of communicating these issues very quickly because radios are constant problems and you need to stay off the radio as much as you can. You need to get that meaning across in two or three syllables if you can. So my burn partner knows, I've heard this, I need to make my way there. I've heard this, I need to get there right now. And everybody else in our burn program knows if there is a mobile asset inside the block that is no longer mobile, stay off the radio unless you have your own legitimate emergency. Everybody understands that you don't need to be updated if you're the burn boss. Let them figure it out, get that bike clear, get the fire away, howsoever. Those are clear procedures and you need to be able to just communicate that effectively, quickly get the job done, get the bike unstuck, and then, then update the burn boss or everybody else. Also our burn program, whenever you hear a bike stuck, everybody kind of starts to preposition as long as they stick with their main mission, no freelancing. However, if you can get into like, well, maybe they might need, I'll start moving that way. Or yeah, let's, let's maybe ease over towards the dozer. You know, we have one, so it's right there. You know, those are all part of the program to kind of, you know, move this, get things ready because this might get worse and worse. This stuff can go very bad very quickly. Know your equipment. So I have, I've been operating Winky for a long time and I know exactly how wide that bike is. And I can look at the trees pretty well and I say, I cannot get through those trees. I can say, okay, two inch uh, laurel oak, probably two inch turkey oak. Yeah, I can get right over that and break it off. Two inch live oak, no, no. So being familiar with that and also every one of them have its quirks. Like we almost have assigned bikes at this point because I know Winky's quirks. My partner knows another one that go that way. And that is a pretty big deal having a burn partner. That's always been an issue. We can't have it as a policy. It's a BMP, two bikes in the block at the same time, though that's more, you know, more coordination is more cooperative, uh, cooperation and more opportunity to have a communication issue. But we try to have two. So, you know, she's nearby. So we can help me if I get stuck, which happens. The pre-flight check, every bike gets one of those, you know, before. Before you go, it doesn't matter who brought it to the fire. It doesn't matter how you used it yesterday. You go everything on the bike that, uh, you know, does it have drive fuel? Does it have fighting fuel? Is the water working? Is the pump working? Are any hoses cracked? All of these come from issues. Running out of fuel in the middle of the block. It's happened. A hose crack that splits and sprays burn mix on you. It's happened. A mud dauber that has built a nest inside the neck of your fire extinguisher. It has happened. So you check everything is the winch working is, you know, that's, that's kind of standard. And it leads finally to kind of the go, no go, which looks a lot like a thumbs up or a thumbs down to your partner so that we can continue, do, continue doing this. It is a dangerous thing to do. It generates a lot of minor injuries and can generate some major injuries. And it can generate a lot of paperwork. You just got to get that line, do your risk assessment. 
and figure out if you are comfortable with that. And if you're not, fine. We have a lot of people that don't do this. That is absolutely fine. We need people to do all sorts of things. But there are a few of us that do go in and get these bikes and get stuff done. So far, it's worked. Maybe I'll have a different story next year, but so far, it's been good. All right, that's what I've got. Thank you for your time. You say that you had an electric ATV or more of a UTV? Ah. Um, I haven't. I don't have any experience. RH, have you dealt with those? We use UTVs all the time, but not for ignition. We have our setup as kind of skinny type sevens. Um, but I haven't used the electric bikes or electric machines. It's still the same, you know, diesel choke machines. Sir. Yeah. For, uh, for driving. Uh, so the question was whether we use non-ethanol. We do because we have our own fuel on the installation. Um, I, I don't know, everybody here has a horror story about ethanol chewing stuff up, right? So we try everything that you can do to minimize a fail. We do that or we try to. Um, so I don't know, marine gas, if you can, was it like 20% more expensive? I mean, but a bike is 10 grand. So Sir? All right, I was wondering how long it to keep the horse for a winter. Well, the, the horses, is, the, the horses belong, actually belong to uh, one of our employees. Uh, he and his wife uh, raised every one of them, trained every one of them, and he retired in 2020, and the program retired with him. <laughs> We'd love to still have them if we could. Great. Great. Super Hazen. Um, what kind of helmet or head protection do you require when you incorporate the Okay, so uh, interior ignition and line stuff. No, sorry, the question was regarding safety headgear. So we use standard fire helmets inside the block. You're going three miles an hour, ideally. The installation has a policy that if you are on the road going anywhere, you're going to have a crash helmet. And those entities that have ATVs on the installation that are not us definitely use those. We trailer our bikes to the fire. We don't drive them over the roads. We use them either interior or on the line scouting. If you're scouting at 50 miles an hour, you're not scouting. Um, so we have a kind of a rider with our state safety officer to stick with our fire helmets. Nothing further? All right, thank you very much.